look around your house, I bet half your stuff says made in China. And most of that will have been shipped from here, Shanghai. Within 20 years, China will be the world's number one economic superpower. And if you want to know what the future looks like, then look no further, because when China rules the world, Shanghai will be the biggest, mightiest, richest, and most riotous city on planet Earth. Shanghai is Communist China's showpiece city to wow the world. And incredibly, it's bucked the global recession to become the greatest boom town on Earth. There are currently 116,000 multimillionaires living here in Shanghai. They're called the Baofa Hu, or the explosive rich. How big do you think you can be as a businessman? Double Bill Gates. Double Bill Gates. But this is no accident. It's a state-planned economic mission. It must be the great Chinese dream, isn't it, to be top dogs? To be treated as one of the superpower of the world, yes. In this communist paradox, where the super-rich rub shoulders with the desperately poor, there are capitalist winners... Pearl, can you pass the salt, please? ..and socialist losers. The people who live here get displaced anywhere the government sees fit. It's full of Eastern promise. Might be a mind-blowing modern-day economic gold rush. But let's not forget it's been engineered by a totalitarian state that's offered up its cheap labour to the world, and we've all bought into it. <laughs> Shanghai sits on the edge of the East China Sea, halfway between Hong Kong and Beijing. It's bisected by the Huangpu River, a physical divide between the old and the new. Over there is Puxi, which houses a legendary bunt, for decades a playground for Shanghai's rich. It's Art Deco buildings giving you a taste of what it was all like back in the 30s. Built by the British as a hub for their Far Eastern trade, it housed the banks and custom house, which first put Shanghai on the world map as a cosmopolitan international city. Over there is Pudong. 15 years ago, that was all swamp land. Today, its skyline matches anything in New York's Manhattan. It's a real statement of intent one that says this city means business. That is the future of Shanghai and the world. But as these computer graphics show, the Chinese state isn't finished yet. They've got a five-year plan, and at the end of it, the mighty Shanghai Tower will complete the project. Quite a task, but the man in charge of building this half-kilometre-high colossus isn't Chinese, he's a Scot, Callum McBean. I mean, I quite like the fact that they're building the biggest tower in China, but it takes British brains to do it. <laughs> British brains along with Chinese labour and manpower and uh, finance as part of this. Absolutely. Is, I mean, is that the marriage made in heaven? Very much so, and that'll take us to Mars, probably. How big are some of these? The Pearl Tower here, this is 468 metres. So it's going to be a third of big again? Yes. I mean, that's going to be the landmark building, isn't it? It is. It's meant to be the capital piece of the Shanghai skyline. I mean, the scale of it, compared to where they were even 20 years ago... Prior to 1990, the tallest building here was a 20-metre high fire station. Now, they have over 1,100 skyscrapers. That's some rate of change, but then authoritarian states don't worry about public inquiries or planning permission. They just do whatever they like. They want to make sure that Shanghai is the best city in the world, it is the gateway to China, and they want to make it successful in every way, shape or form. Over the last 15 years, this place has increased in size six-fold and doubled its population to 20 million. It's a city on steroids, offering incredible opportunities for those with a vision to cash in. You may not realise it, but HSBC has always been more than just a British high street stalwart. It stands for the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, and it's been here for over 150 years. Shanghai is its home. 
And to give you some idea just how important this place now is to the company, they spent £35 million moving their HQ from that tower there to this tower over here, a distance of about 500 yards. And the reason they've done this is so that you can see their new logo from over the river there. Why? Well, because HSBC wants a front row, high profile seat in the world's future financial hub. It's all part of the Communist Party's master plan and a million miles away from the fanatical forces that seized power in 1949. Chairman Mao must have turned in his grave when today's communist decreed in 1992 that it's glorious to be rich. China has presided over double-digit growth ever since. This is Shanghai's Rolls-Royce showroom. Only there's one slight problem. There are no actual Rolls-Royces. They've all been sold. There was one here this morning, but somebody snapped it up. It's become this classic British brand, a top status symbol for Shanghai's rich. And it's certainly not cheap. A Rolls-Royce Phantom here will set you back £700,000, nearly double the UK price. And it's the likes of 36-year-old Charlie Zhong who are emptying Shanghai's car showrooms. State-trained as an architect, he left his government job to set up a hotel and architectural business. Now he can buy any of these top-of-the-range motors on a whim. This is a Cadillac? Yeah, on Cadillac. And you bought this because you saw it in a movie, yeah? Yeah, I saw it in the movie Matrix. The Matrix? Matrix. And you thought, I'm going to have one of those? Yeah. Is it I, good, I good made the decision when I left the, the, the cinema. I do the decision. Really? Yeah. I'm lucky he didn't go to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Charlie's millionaire lifestyle is a world away from his parents' rural poverty. Cadillac Porsche. Porsche. The modern Shanghai. Yeah. You are very much the new, modern, dynamic face of Shanghai. Yeah, uh, actually, it is. When you were young, mm -hmm. did you ever dream that one day you'd be a multi-millionaire with a Cadillac and no, all the girls no, chasing you and all never, that kind of Never, never. Because I don't know the car. You'd never heard of a Cadillac? Yeah, I never heard the name of Cadillac or the, the Porsche, the, the, the Ferrari. I have no idea. What did I, you... I even don't know the, the red wine. The French uh, cuisine. Uh, I have no idea, you know. What I, was your dream then? To be a great architect, just like the, the Norman Foster, yeah. Sir Norman yes. Foster. That's you want to be dream. like him? Yes, that's the dream. How big do you think you can be as a businessman? Maybe we can do double Bill Gates. Double Bill Gates? Maybe. Everything can be true in here, in Shanghai, in China. Do you genuinely think, Charlie, you've got a chance of being twice as big as Bill Gates? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I believe that. Should he be worried, Bill Gates? Yes, he must worry about the Chinese guy. Yeah. There is a lot of young guys like me, uh, maybe millions. What you're saying is, in China, mm -hmm. there's millions of Charlies. Yeah. And, and you're millions. coming, right? Yeah, You're coming, coming for us. Yeah, I'm coming. It's this bullish attitude that's given Shanghai its competitive edge, turning it into the capitalist playground that the rest of his socialist state aspires to. The one thing I'm learning about Shanghai is they don't do things by halves here, and they definitely don't like coming second. For example, when they heard there were a few big hotels going up in places like Dubai and Seoul, they thought to themselves, nah, we can do better than that. And they built this, the Park Hyatt, which at 93 storeys is officially the highest hotel in the history of mankind. Let's just hope this is all built on more than Dubai's shifting economic sands. You'll find the best room here on the 88th floor. Wow! Now that is a view. But so it should be, because in communist China, you don't just get an ordinary president suite, you get one of these babies, a chairman suite at eight thousand pounds a night but for that you do get quite a lot you get your own private kitchen with your own chef your own butler a steam room an infinity pool just about every form of capitalist luxury you could wish for and it's not for us foreign westerners it's the local communists who are lapping it up i just wonder if this is what chairman mao had in mind when he brought in the cultural revolution shanghai is changing the world's preconceptions of red china though not without some help from a new breed of British expat. 
26 year old, bit of a Sloan. You probably wouldn't mind that, would you? Bit of a Sloan, that's what I was going to say. I tried to get to grips with the local produce. Blimey. Very easy, Tiger. At the last count, there were 20 million people calling this place home. And they keep coming at a rate of 200,000 a year. Shanghai is one of the biggest cities on Earth. And everyone's here for exactly the same thing. Money. It's a far cry from rural China, where peasants exist on pitiful incomes, less than a third of their city comrades. Meanwhile, luxury apartment blocks are springing up all over Shanghai to house the new urban super-rich. This one's owned by Pearl Lamb, a multi-millionaire art dealer whose personal collection takes up an entire floor. So she's had to move out to the lavish penthouse above it. Lovely to see you. Lovely Thank you for inviting you. me in. Oh, my God. How far does it go? You can the... skate through. Is this your dining room table? Yes. How many do you get around there? Uh, if I push to the limit, it's 66. 66 people? Yeah. Pearl, can you pass the salt, please? <laughs> Very Art Deco, isn't it? This is not Art Deco, this is 60s. I knew I said the wrong thing. Uh, what's in here? This is like being on the Starship Enterprise. Isn't that great? <laughs> when you have a hangover, does it feel a bit dizzy in here? Uh, no. Actually, I feel great here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my favourite bit, a self-opening loo. And there's a terrace opening out onto a view only the wealthiest could afford. Whoa. Look at that. What a view. This penthouse is all about entertaining, so Pearl's invited a few of her influential pals over for a power chat with me. There's Lynn, the internet entrepreneur, Ilaria, the industrialist, and Zoe, the film producer. All of you four ladies are very successful in your own right. Laura, you, you actually run a big manufacturing business for some of the most famous fashion brands in the world, don't you? Who do you make clothes for? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Why can't you tell me who they are? I have the contract with them. I'm not allowed to talk who are producing in my factory. But these are some of the biggest brands in the world. Uh, we are known. <laughs> Famous? I think so. But they don't want the world I'm to know. I'm sorry on that. I they don't, don't, I don't want to go deeper. <laughs> no, but they don't want the world to know that you're ma making yeah. them in Shanghai. Oh, uh, sorry, I cannot go deeper. <laughs> 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 See, what I love about Shanghai is the women are all so confident and, as the Americans would say, you kick butt. I think the Shanghai woman rules because it is the husband who cook, who look after the children, who does everything because... Really? ..they worship the ladies. What, the guys come home from a hard day's work and they cook, <laughs> clean, uh -huh. look after the kids? Uh -huh. What do you lot do? All go out on the rack? No, they, you know, they're being worshipped. <laughs> Here, yeah, when you get married, you don't carry your husband's name. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah, that's true. This is the communist rules. That's true. <laughs> yeah. See, there are some things about communist China that obviously are rather good, like that, Very from your liberal, point of view. Yes. Very liberal, I don't know. Yeah. And are you, are you free to talk about anything here? I mean, can you talk about politics quite freely and openly? In a private, you know, in a private environment, I think you can talk about anything, right? Yeah. yeah. Communism might have brought equality for women and perhaps the well-heeled can speak freely in their secluded penthouses. But just two minutes down the road, things are rather different. Here you'll find the familiar authoritarian face of Red China. This is Shanghai's old town, where life is lived on the street. Excuse me. Another back up. The poor have been here for decades, but they won't be around for much longer. These streets and communities are being demolished to complete the next stage of the government's urban plan. All over the old part of Shanghai, you'll see signs like this on buildings, which means they've been condemned, effectively. The government's decided to knock them down and to build something new and exciting. Now, the people who live here get displaced anywhere the government sees fit, and there's no right of appeal, no petition, this is communist China. You're out, mate. The alternative is to be rehoused in new state-built suburban developments or accept cash compensation. 
But there have been angry protests by the Shanghainese who live here over the derisory amounts the government's offering as an incentive to move away from this very valuable inner city land. So I was surprised by how accepting this man was about his resettlement. He's lived here for 56 years. Is this the price that you have to pay for change in Shanghai? So it's really interesting. The government decided one day to knock down his property and displace him eight kilometres away from here, away from everything he knows. And yet his attitude is one of great pride that he's doing his bit for the national cause. With a population density already four times that of New York's, I guess something's got to give to house the hundreds of thousands of rural migrants who arrive here every year searching for that Shanghai dream. Yet the 20 million people who live in Shanghai are just the tip of China's 1.3 billion population. It's a massive potential market, whichever way you look at it. And the thought of grabbing just a small slice has Western businesses salivating. I'm standing here in the middle of Nanjing Road, which is Shanghai's number one shopping street. And to be honest with you, it feels almost exactly the same as standing in the middle of central London. You've got iconic brands like Marks and Spencers, Tesco's down the road, Chanel, Gucci, Armani, all the stuff you'd expect back home. Even down to the appalling traffic and the dozens of Chinese restaurants. I know what you're thinking. He goes all the way to Shanghai just for his weekly shop. Well, let me tell you, it's worth it, because whenever I go out of my local store, they are fresh out of eels. Now I know why Tesco calls itself a convenience store. Blimey. Easy, Tiger. In many ways, this is just like a normal Tesco's back home. Here's the coffee, for example, Nescafe, Maxwell House. But if you're after a late-night stimulant, I really wouldn't bother with that end of the market. I'd come over here where you have what you don't get in your local Tesco's back home. For example, this little jar of magic. Apparently, for about £45, a few sips of that at night, and there are snakes, terrapins, and some unmentionable creatures. That will keep you up in every sense all night long, gentlemen. This is my kind of Tesco's. Back on the high street, and you're bombarded by more Western brands, but there's no pound stretcher here. After Japan, China's now the second largest spender on luxury goods. Incredible in a communist state where once everyone wore identical Mao suits. On, Barbie, let's go party. Amongst the names jostling for position in this exploding market is Barbie, the ultimate symbol of Western perfection. This is her first sixth floor superstore. Yet sales of the Oriental version don't come close to the classic blonde-haired pneumatic Barbie, which accounts for 85% of all dolls sold here. And expats are arriving in droves to grab their own piece of Oriental pie. Olivia Van Halle is one of the 150,000 foreigners now calling Shanghai home. What do you do here? Um, so I'm a trend forecaster, so I predict uh, fashion trends and consumer trends and give advice to brands who are coming out to China. And in simple terms, what is driving the Chinese mad about Western trends at the moment, would you say? Their economy's absolutely exploded and we've suddenly got this huge number of extremely rich Chinese, a lot of whom come from um, the centre of China. And when they want to spend their money, they want to do it in a way that everybody knows what they're doing. And uh, so it needs to be with big brands that everyone's heard of. They want to, you know, Chanel, Prada, Burberry. So it's about showing off as it's much as anything. Con yeah, conspicuous consumption. But For people watching this, what is Shanghai like? I mean, you're, you're how old are you? I'm 26. 26 year old, bit of a Sloan. You probably wouldn't mind that, would you? What a Sloan? That's what I'm going to say. Bit of a Sloan. <laughs> And you've come over here to set up a new life. What's it yeah. actually been like for you? Um, it's been fantastic. It's the easiest thing. The expat community out here is still relatively small, although it's growing the whole time. And it's so nice to have been able to get away from London. We'll talk about the recession, which we've missed entirely. So I've I mean, no there's idea not much sign on. of recession here, right? There's absolutely no sign of recession. Yeah, I don't think some of the girls driving down my road in brand new Lamborghinis completely kitted out with <laughs> Hello Kitty would even know what a recession was. Tell me about the actual 
living standards here? I mean, what's your life like at home? What, do you have help there? Yes, we do have help. I would say the whole expat community generally on the whole have help. So everybody has what's called an IE. What's an IE? An IE, it means auntie. Who, who's but your auntie? Sort of do more. Well, I don't have an auntie, I have an uncle. What's his um, name? He's called Jeff. He's Jeff. amazing. What does yeah. Jeff do? So he does washing, cooking, cleaning, ironing, makes the bed, walks the dog, pays the bills, <laughs> posts the post. Do you do Everyone anything? Everyone needs a Jeff. Do you do? I'm sure we do. <laughs> but I mean, do you do anything yourself? Yes. What do you do? Work very hard, Piers. And yes. Jeff does everything else. Jeff, yep, does everything else. He's super. She does look massively overworked, doesn't she? Olivia is just one of a long line of Brits who've come here to make their mark. For over a hundred years, Shanghai was a cosmopolitan city grown rich on global trade, where expats ran riot. This was an infamous city of sin, the Paris of the East, where anything went, until the communists put a stop to the partygoers in 1949. Bristol-born Norman Gosney, 62, and showgirl wife Amelia, 26, no, no, no sniggers at the back, have come via New York to open Chinatown, a burlesque club that's raised quite a few eyebrows at the government's cultural bureau. Are you, Norman, single-handedly trying to bring the naughtiness back to Shanghai? Back in the day, in the 30s, there was a very... The most famous of the naughty nightclubs was a place called The Great World, and it had six floors going up and as you're getting smaller as they went up and they got naughtier mm. and more exclusive as you went up what happened at the top we're hoping to open the seventh floor <laughs> <laughs> from what you gleaned what was it really like in shanghai back in the 30s i think what everyone's idea of it is what hollywood sold us it's shanghai express it's marlena dietrich and stuff and i guess in a way what we're doing here is hollywood's version of that old thing how was it really back in the day Ooh, I think it was pretty, pretty tough. I mean, it was completely lawless. And there was a lot of refugees from all the trouble of the world here, and most of them didn't have money, so they were doing whatever was necessary to earn the money. It was quite hardcore, wasn't it? It was a brutal city. I mean, Norman says he wants to bring back the real naughtiness to Shanghai. Is that, is that how you see your role here, Amelia? Well, here's the thing, is that there is already a lot of naughtiness in Shanghai, but it's all behind closed doors, and it's yeah, not... I've been trying to find it, but it's, it's quite... You sort of... won't find it. It's not really geared towards foreigners. So, you basically, I mean, you don't want this to be seen as in any way sleazy. You know, I think 1930s sleazy, by today's standards, is pretty classy. Yeah. So, I guess we're in that area. very glamorous, but what does the industrial face of Shanghai actually look like? Now, when I think of shipping tycoons, they don't normally look like you. <laughs> I discover the cutting truth about what it really takes to get a job here before mastering a relaxing pyjama art, Shanghai knees style. There's nothing like a bit of this to get you through the stresses of the day. Right, Master Chung? China is the West factory, and as a result, Shanghai has become the world's busiest port, shipping over more than half a billion tonnes of Chinese products every year. The chances are your clothes, TV, and even your cups all come through here. To cope, Shanghai's new deep-water port has grown so fast it needs its own 32.5-kilometre bridge. This is absolutely mind-blowing. If anything sums up the might and power of the new Chinese empire, then this surely is it. It is quite literally the gateway to the world. And doing very well, thank you, from our insatiable appetite for Chinese goods is Sabrina Chow. She was educated at top British public school Charterhouse. And now at just 36, she runs Hua Kuang Shipping, a 30-strong fleet worth a staggering 400 million pounds. Now, when I think of shipping tycoons, they don't normally look like you. <laughs> well, thank you. I They're normally a like big, ugly blokes from Greece or somewhere. But you, I mean, well, you times sort of... are changing. Times yeah, are they changing. are changing, aren't That's they? That's right. There are a lot of uh, ladies uh, ship owners these days. Really? Uh, yeah, for some reasons, all the ship owners in the past generation all seem to have daughters. For really? some reason, <laughs> yeah, so you're seeing more of us coming out. So you're sort of taking over your, your father's business? Yes, I am. How easy is it for a woman to 
run a big business in China these days? It's easier than you think, actually. I think um, China, in many respects, um, is more forward-thinking than other uh, Asian nations, such as um, Japan or Korea. The men here have, a, have respect for ladies. Ironically, our consumption of cheap Chinese goods is giving them the money to turn the tables and buy up the West. A trillion pounds of US government bonds, corporate shares in BP, RBS and Cadbury, to name but a few. So it might be a good idea if we learn to get along together rather well. I mean, it's, it's a crazy place here. That's right. When you come here, you get a sense of China and where it's heading. It must be the great Chinese dream, isn't it, to be top dogs? To be treated as one of the superpower of the world, yes. The superpower, like the number one? I think China still has you know, a few things to learn from the West and uh, some catching up to do. But um, yeah, it's definitely heading that way. There's no doubt that Shanghai looks amazing when you can see it through the smog. Industrialization has its price. Air pollution kills 400,000 people a year in China, and Shanghai is definitely not helping matters. Despite two-thirds of the journeys here being made on two wheels, cars are choking this city. The Shanghai knees are managing the road rage by pushing it underground. 15 years ago, no metro existed here at all. Now it carries three million people a day, and within a decade, it will be twice the length of London's tube, which is currently the largest in the world. We're hundreds of feet under Shanghai itself. We are in the middle of where the big drill is going on, and I'm about to be a part of the new Chinese Industrial Revolution, because Shirley is going to let me do a bit of drilling of Shanghai's new metro. Shirley, hand me the tools. There we go. I am literally boring Shanghai. Probably you lot as well. Yet even with all this modernization going on, there's still an ancient culture that rises to the surface when given half a chance. So here I am in one of Shanghai's many small parks where literally hundreds of thousands of locals will come and do this, Tai Chi. I'm with Master Chong, who is an expert at this very calming form of martial arts. And it is sort of oddly serene, the whole thing. There's nothing like a bit of this to get you through the stresses of the day. Right, Master Chung? So this city's soul may be Chinese, but there's an obvious tension here between the ancient East and the modern West. And on the surface, only one seems to be winning. Hello. Can I ask you to see if you know who these people are? OK. Who is that? David Beckin. Good. Who's that? Queen Elizabeth. Very good. Uh, he's on the American Idol. Uh, I know him. Simon Simon Cowell. Yeah. And the Gordon Bro uh, Mr. Gordon Brown. Yes. You know him? Yeah. Who's he? Beckham. Beckham. I was amazed by how many people actually spoke English. But then I guess that's the benefit of compulsory English lessons throughout school. It looks like a prime minister. Yeah. Okay. Do you know who that is? The Queen. The Queen. Very good. <laughs> Who's that? Big him. Rooney. Rooney, yes. The host of the uh, American Idol? Simon Cowell. Oh, you know him? Yeah. Who's that? Si Simon Cowell. Yeah. yeah. Who's that? Oh, Gordon Brown. <laughs> so China gives us cheap goods and we give them our celebrities and politicians. It seems a fair trade. But there's a more sinister side to the locals' fixation with Western culture. Under intense pressure to get a job in this city, young girls are now eyeing up shocking ways to stand apart from the crowd. This is a book of plastic surgery, but with a difference, because in Shanghai, 
the number one operation for young girls is to alter the shape of their eyes so they look less oriental and more western and i have with me candy yes uh, you're 20 years old yes and you've just had this operation to change the shape of your eyes do you have a photograph of how you used to look oh okay so this is the old candy yes and i can see that the eyes were different shape and now this is the new candy how do you feel uh, it's beautiful i think you look in the mirror and you think you look more beautiful mm, yes today 22 year old yujan is going under the knife it's costing her 700 pounds for the pleasure the equivalent of two months wages yujan why are you having this operation i want to get her a better job Get a better job. Yes. <laughs> and are lots of your friends having the same operation? Uh, yes, about six or seven. Really? Yeah. And do you hope that you will look like Victoria Beckham at the end of this? Yes, I like <laughs> her eyes. You know, very, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Oh. And doctor, have, have you had it done? Yes. 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 Well, good luck. Good luck. I hope it goes well. Thank you. <laughs> right, if you're squeamish, look away right now, because 40 minutes and one local anaesthetic later, and Yu Jan's Victoria Beckham transplant is complete. <laughs> Shanghai might be redefining the world's image of communist China, but don't forget this is still a one-party state where human rights are routinely abused. There's no independent judiciary, and in the last year alone, 1,700 people have been executed. Even drink driving can carry the death penalty. But still, you might be surprised at just how far the leadership will go to keep their draconian grip on the masses. I'm sitting in a very smart cafe, drinking a very palatable frappuccino, and I'm on the wireless internet clicking on the BBC News website. But, and it's a big but, you try clicking on other sites, and I don't mean the ones you might expect, like Tiananmen Square or Tibet, but I mean things like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and MySpace, and you get this. Safari can't open the page. As far as the Chinese authorities are concerned, the number one menace is social networking. And they're so terrified about it, they're now employing 30,000 people whose specific job is to censor the internet, to stop young people in China communicating with young people around the world. It's state censorship like this that led to the current battle between internet giant Google and the Chinese government. Yet in this digital age, it's naive to believe that the online generation are that easy to control. Hit Shanghai's clubs for a night, you could easily forget you're even in China. Certainly 25-year-old designer Queenie and her best friend Celine, 30, a freelance illustrator, would laugh at the notion that Big Brother is watching their every physical, let alone digital, move. Well, look, no offence, but I was not expecting this. This is lovely. Thank you. I mean, you've got loads of Western DVDs there, and you've got your Blackberries. What's in the fridge? Mm. Bottle of champagne. It's more like takeaways, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you've got, you know, this lovely furniture, big plasma telly. I mean, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, we got most of what we want. <laughs> <laughs> but what about outsmarting state internet controls? So I imagine you're so smart, you young people in Shanghai. I'd imagine that every time they try and shut these things down, you just find a way of getting around it, right? We have to. <laughs> <laughs> There's ways around it. How careful do you have to be not to offend the authorities? Wow, well, I don't think about it. There's Talk enough about. blogs and websites yeah. and kids are, you know, diverse enough that you can't monitor basically everything. So really, the Chinese authorities are beginning to lose control of your generation because they can't control the internet. Mm. They can't really control what you say or think anymore. Slowly, yes. Yeah. They are, yes. And what's the nightlife like? Uh, just a lot going on. You are, have lots of options. You have to, like, you, you receive a lot of invitations. You have to pick which one you're more interested in. So you're in hot demand, are you, Queenie? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Shanghai's youth know all our Western brands and celebrities, routinely hack the web, have great taste in clothes, and like nothing more than to have a good time at places like Mint, Shanghai's trendiest club and restaurant. They're exactly like us, though. Or are they? What I'm about to do is truly shocking, because the Chinese are getting really big into their French wine. The trouble is, they don't really like the taste. So what they do is take a bottle of this, a nice 2003 Chateau Pomerol. They do what we would all do with it, which is pour it into a nice glass. And then they commit what I think is absolute vino sacrilege. They take Coca-Cola and they pour it on top. And then they drink it. Oof! If that's progress, you can stick it. Mind you, I guess they feel the same way when they see us putting milk in our tea. And actually, when it comes to the finer things in life, they're catching up fast. I mean, the foie gras is magnificent. I honestly rate the foie gras very high. <laughs> it's amazing. And I'm shocked by dirty dealings and the beautiful game. I hear that it's as corrupt as hell. Referees getting bags of cash before the game, and then you'll have to replenish that at half time. The Chinese are a very clever bunch. Their expertise lies in nicking our Western ideas and then doing them bigger, better, and cheaper. There are small towns and cities all over this country which have global monopolies on your household goods. 90% of the world's buttons are made in China. 95% of the world's duvets. 85% of the world's toys. That's why the Chinese are getting so rich, and that's why we in the West are getting so nervous that China is taking over the world. But even I feel slightly unnerved to discover that one of Britain's most iconic brands is being hand-built right here in Shanghai. I never thought I'd find a black cab factory here in China. All right, boys, ready for work? But after decades of manufacturing in Coventry, they're building them here as well now. Project manager John Law explained why. See, I'm torn, John, if I'm honest. They make all the duvets, they make all the pillows, <laughs> they make all the toys. Couldn't they just keep their hands off our black cabs? Well, they have, because we will be building in the UK and selling in the UK. This, this joint venture here opens up big markets for us that the Comtry plant couldn't probably achieve. Who's buying these things? This opens up all of Asia and lots of other international markets. But why China? Well, the maths speak for themselves. An average Shanghai wage is just £3,500 a year, but it costs at least six times that to employ a worker in the UK. There's a lot said back in Britain about, you know, slave labour conditions for workers in China and stuff. How are they looked after here? I actually think they're looked after well here and they're expected to work hard, but I think that is the case in the UK in certain uh, factories as well. Of course, there's also the fact that, unlike the UK, there are no independent trade unions here. So wages are kept profitably low, which means our goods are affordably cheap, and we are all therefore complicit in this merry-go-round. What's it been like for you? I mean, you're a classic Brummie. And here you are, <laughs> transported into yeah. this completely different world. What's it been like? It's great. I mean, it really is. I always find everybody very helpful. Are they good to do business with? Yes, definitely, yeah. But they yeah. want to win, right? They want to be number one. Yes, they do want to win. And you just have to fight your corner. Got used to the food yet? Food is great. No problem <laughs> with the food at all. Well, I suppose, to be honest, in Coventry, it's all, it's all curries and Chinese anyway, isn't it? <laughs> it that's one view, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, when it comes to the food here in Shanghai, there seems to be no limit to what they can produce. Now, this is what I call a meal. Foie gras with the finest truffle, roast pigeon, caviar, and an assortment of delightful delicacies for pudding. For wine, a fine Cabernet Sauvignon and a delicious Chardonnay. But here's the twist. All of this was produced in or around this city. This is Laris, perhaps the finest dining experience in Shanghai. Just filling out the place costs two and a half million pounds. It's run by David Laris, an Aussie chef who once ran Terence Conran's largest restaurant in London. David, how are you? Good, thank you. Now, all of this basically comes from 
Shanghai, all the surroundings. Absolutely. It's one of the things that people love to hear about as well. As it's a surprise. But I have to say, at the moment, I haven't tasted it. Mm -hmm. And you will know that I'm a very <laughs> discerning connoisseur. I get stuck in like this? Yeah, please go ahead. No, I've had a lot of caviar in my time, David. And I think you're having the beluga there. That's the Chinese beluga. I mean, that's pretty good. That's got a proper caviar taste to it. I mean, how good is this from your point of view? Well, to be honest with you, we'd be lying if we said it's as good as the best, finest uh, Iranian beluga, uh, you know, or, or, or royal beluga out there. But it is certainly very, very good. And I what think it compares. What I have with that? A little, little better than the old Chardonnay? Yeah, a little Chardonnay. I mean, I have never heard of Chinese wine, let alone drunk it before. Yeah. What should I, should I be fearing the worst here? No, you know, I think the ones we picked for you are, are the best of, of what's around here in, in these parts. But what's, in, what's incredible is, is a staggering amount of, of wine that's made and sold here to you banquets. See, that is quite nice. Yeah. I see, these are the ones that I, this is the one I picked it the best. So they're, they're doing to wine really what the Chinese do to everything we do. They're taking it, making it bigger and better, and probably going to flog it back to us. I think the, the wines are a little further off, but I can see where it will mature to that point. But certainly many other products, most definitely. I mean, the foie gras is magnificent. I think these guys are doing a pretty good job. I mean, there are lots of very rich people in Shanghai. What are the craziest lunches or dinners you've had in here? Uh, I mean, we had three chaps come in and spend about 25, 30,000 RMB within 30 minutes and then left. So about 3,000 pounds. Yeah, back. In and out. Um, Half an hour. Quick, quick, quick bite, quick, <laughs> quick drop. Um, but we've had, we've had customers come in and, and spend the equivalent of, you know, six, 7,000 pounds on a, on a dinner for two. Blimey. Well, since the slap up Chinese in town costs about a fiver, it's not exactly cheap. I wonder if they were hungry again half an hour later. At this point, you might be panicking that China's taking over the world. But don't worry, there's still one great British export that they haven't quite mastered yet, although the state does have a plan for this too. <laughs> it's amazing. Like an English ground. This is Shanghai Shenhua FC, who last year finished second in the Chinese Premiership. Like every other team in this league, they were formed just 17 years ago after party officials decided that football was vital for national prestige. As English football commentator Rowan Simons explained, it's a game of two halves. Rowan, here we are at the middle of Shanghai's match. There's no doubt there's a very anglicised feel to this. I mean, they've got, you know, the famous Liverpool banner, you'll never walk alone. It's all been nicked. Yeah. From, from Britain, really, isn't it? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, sort of mid-80s when China started opening up, that's when the TV opened up. They started watching football on television. At the time, they were watching the likes of Liverpool doing well in Europe. And that's the, the culture of football that they picked up on. I hear that it's as corrupt as hell. Yeah, there's many stories of uh, referees getting lumps of cash or bags of cash before the game, both teams coming in. And then you'll have to replenish that at half-time. Very, very serious corruption issues here throughout uh, the history of the league. And the that goes on even at professional level like this? Especially at the professional level. I have to say, we, we do amateur games, or charity cups, and we have the same thing happening there. It makes our premiership look streaky clean, doesn't it? But what about this state plan to become the world's number one footballing nation? What would worry me is that when they got their act together with athletics, it took about 10 minutes. And the next thing we knew, that was the Olympics gone. Well, I mean, athletics was actually not the case. They didn't win a single medal in athletics. What they did 10 years ago is choose which sports they thought the rest of the world was weak in right. and concentrate on those. There's a lot of women's weightlifting. There aren't that many women weightlifting around the world. Sh uh, shooting and things like this. They were quite cunning. They were very, very cunning and an absolute state plan to win the Olympics by targeting sports that other countries didn't take seriously. From the look of this lot, they've got a long way to go with football. I mean, on a positive note, it's quite comforting that the one thing they can't do better than us is football. Well, absolutely, and we should be very comforted by that because they're bloody useless. <laughs> Shanghai has revealed itself to be a heady fusion of both East and West, an emerging giant wrought from the most compelling principles of seemingly opposite ideologies. This city is all that's best about capitalism and communism and all that's worst. I can only liken it to Victorian London, where the super rich and the desperately poor live together in this vast, smouldering cauldron of consumption and construction, everything on a gigantic scale like a modern-day industrial revolution. And just like those Victorians, there's a super-confidence which is really infectious about here. 
Recent surveys show that 83% of Chinese believe that tomorrow will be better than today. And Shanghai epitomizes that attitude.